Hey there, this is NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Glenn Weldon. Author Kennedy Ryan is not a member of the indigenous community, but the heroine of her romance novel, The Kingmaker, is. She's a Yavapai Apache activist who falls for the son of a local oil baron. Ryan is very aware that many non-Indigenous authors before her have set out to tell stories about the lives of Indigenous people and done so in exploitative ways. How did she deal with that in writing this book? Well, there's really only a way to do it responsibly, and you'll hear her talk about it. Basically, she put in the work. She made every effort not to appropriate Indigenous culture, but to seriously engage with it in a sustained, thoughtful, and respectful way that was backed by research and by listening. She talked to indigenous people, had them read the draft, and incorporated their feedback. She sought their permission. Ryan and NPR's Chloe Veltman discussed those efforts and why she chose to self-publish the book back in 2019. USA Today best-selling author Kennedy Ryan is the creator of genre-defying works of romantic fiction. Her novels fearlessly explore serious topics like divorce, domestic abuse and climate change. And they focus on strong women characters, often from underrepresented communities, who are firmly in control of their destinies, if not always their passions. Now, the romance fiction imprint Bloom Books is coming out with five of Ryan's previously self-published titles. The first, The Kingmaker, opens on a startling scene at a protest. A young Yavapai Apache activist is trying to protect her tribal lands from the ravages of an oil pipeline. She's arrested and finds herself stuck overnight in jail with a handsome fellow protester who turns out to be the son of her sworn enemy, the billionaire oil baron behind the pipeline. Their lives become inextricably linked from there. Author Kennedy Ryan joined me in Los Angeles, where she was participating in the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. Hello, Kennedy. Thank you for being here. Hi, Chloe. Thank you for having me. If I could use one word to describe your heroine, Lennox Moon Hunter, it would be fierce. What makes her tick? What makes her tick, first of all, is just being so connected to her community of origin. She's connected to um, the passion and the protest that is inherently a part of her particular marginalized community, she is an indigenous heroine. And um, I approached that with such reverence. You know, I am actually, I'm a black woman, and um, I knew I wanted to write a series that spanned a couple of books with a black heroine and an indigenous heroine who are best friends and start a political consulting firm. And when I wrote her story, I just dove right into um, all of that heritage. And I think that's a huge part of what makes her tick. Lennox's story often cycles back to a tribal coming-of-age ceremony that had an outsized impact on her psyche. How did you go about making her her world, her tribal roots, feel so vivid? Uh, First of all, um, that is a particular rite of passage that was actually outlawed by the American government in the 1800s in their efforts to westernize indigenous people. It actually had to go underground until until the 1970s. By the time I decided to write about it, literally you can go on YouTube and look at it, you know, it's everywhere. Um, But it was something that was so crucial to not only her as a girl going into a woman, but other girls in other tribes across the country who would be undergoing that same thing. And um, I actually consulted a medicine man, you know, to make sure that it wasn't harmful, that there was no misrepresentation. Um, I wrote this based on several interviews with indigenous women, research, books that they asked me to read before we even had conversations. And one of them happened to be the granddaughter of a medicine man. And when he heard that I was writing it, he goes, oh, I'm not sure that she can write that. And I said, I, I will not publish it. If he thinks that I shouldn't, I will not publish it. So he read it and he said, it's great. And we went forward. Phew. That, that must have been a, a, a really wonderful moment. Uh, yes, for two days it was harrowing <laughs> because it took him that long to read it. Um, but I wasn't going to go forward until he and the women who um, were from that marginalized experience felt good about it. And this is something really, really crucial because it hurts me when I see cultural appropriation in romance and literature. When I released this book, and it's even in the books now, I was careful to make sure to include links to indigenous-owned voices and romance authors authors who are indigenous because we need to amplify those voices. If I'm going to take up any of that space, I want to make sure that I'm pouring back into that community and not being exploitative. 
There aren't too many romance novels that tackle climate change. It's arguably the most important topic of our time, but some might say it's not incredibly sexy. What made you decide to focus on this issue? I really wanted to address it because so many people are saying that climate change is not real, you know, and that the patterns that we're seeing and what science is actually projecting for our planet, um, that we are at a critical mass, that we're approaching critical mass, watching the difficulty of passing legislation that would be sweeping and that would be meaningful. I wanted to address it. You know, it all started with me seeing footage of the Dakota Pipeline protest. That is what triggered the whole thing for me. And so I just felt like it was something important that I wanted to address. And I wanted to see a hero who was passionate about it. He gets a PhD in climate science um, and dedicates his entire life to educating people and to creating products that are more sustainable. Um, I just hadn't seen that in romance. And I wanted a hero who, who was passionate about that. The Kingmaker first came out in 2019, right? And you self-published it. Why did you decide to go that route with this and some of your other books? I started out traditionally published, which was a great experience, um, but I was seeing so many authors, especially marginalized authors, like a lot of times when we don't have space in certain rooms and space at certain tables, we have to go build our own tables. And I saw a lot of authors doing that, but specifically I was looking at black and brown authors who weren't finding as much traction in traditional spaces doing that. And I decided to give it a try. And I love the creative control, the editorial control. I'm very involved in covers. Um, and that's really how I built my career. But I also knew that at one point, I would come back to traditional publishing. I wanted a broader reach. You know, the last few releases have been doing that for me. These stories are so important to me. The place they come from is so important to me. It's a place of passion and creative conviction. My goal is to have as many people read these stories as possible. And so that was a natural next step for me was to find a partner, a traditional partner who was willing to do that and who was passionate about getting these stories into bookstores, into airports, into, you know, places all over so that more people can access them. The Kingmaker has a sequel, The Rebel King. Bloom Books is planning to release this title in June. How does the second part of the duology build on its predecessor? The Kingmaker ends on a literal cliffhanger. And in The Rebel King, we take up from there and it really builds them as people. One thing that's interesting, I think, about this story is there's a, a gap between uh, where the couple is separated for 10 years. And so many readers are like, 10 years? What were they doing in 10 years? Well, for 10 years, she was figuring out who she wanted to be as a woman. She was figuring out what she wanted her path to be. She was building an organization that was going to elect leaders who, vo who voted according to her philosophies and beliefs. Like she wasn't sitting around twiddling her thumbs or waiting for this man. It's very important for me to see her building. And in the second book, we see her now joining a presidential election potentially um, electing a president who can advance all kinds of legislation, but the legislation she's most important about, missing and murdered indigenous women. And we see him taking those same steps. So we see both of them continuing as they're falling in love with each other, staying true to what's most important to them. I heard these books were inspired by Shonda Rhimes' TV thriller Scandal, right? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about Shonda Rhimes and what it is about her work that speaks to you. I think Shonda Rhimes is a trailblazer. You know, I have so much admiration for her and women like her, Ava DuVernay, like storytellers who come from a very specific perspective, who create from conscience. The thing that I really love about Scandal and even some of her other shows is it centers these powerful women, usually women of color, who are also allowed to be vulnerable. So many times the strong black woman myth is perpetuated and that's true. Like I know black women who are incredibly strong, but I also think that it's dangerous for us not to give black and brown women space to be fully dimensional and fully human. And that's one thing that I admire about what Shonda does is that she creates this palette where these women can be incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, but also incredibly imperfect and vulnerable and dimensional. And I hope that I can follow a path like what Shonda and other creators of color are doing. It's like also joy, like seeing black and brown joy. That's incredibly important. And it's something that I want to be centered in my work. Kennedy Ryan is the author of The Kingmaker, out on May 23rd from Bloom Books. Thank you so much for joining me, Kennedy. Thank you, Chloe, for having me.